when we look at the religions of China, religions of the East, and we'll focus on China. We have to recognize that they are a group and there is considerable, let's call it cross pollination so that Buddhism, for example, comes from India and elements of Buddhism coexist and are, are added to by Taoism, which is, which is a religion or philosophy that already existed in India. So you have this melding of religious traditions that is sometimes confusing to an outsider, someone outside of the culture who wants to, wants to pigeonhole people into one religion or another. This doesn't necessarily work so well in China. So we're talking today about the religions of the East and focusing on China, but of course China has considerable cultural impact on the whole region. So China influences religious development in Korea, Japan, Vietnam, um, and there are similar themes that you see in those regions as well. So we'll start talking a little bit about yin and yang. There is this very basic and ancient concept that we find in ancient Chinese thought, this idea of the balance in nature, a sometimes seen as a, a um, male-female principle, coexisting and dependent on each other. If you look at the traditional yin-yang symbol, notice that the light is within the dark, and the dark is within the light. And there is this coexistence that makes the whole. It is this fundamental principle that is reflected in religious traditions, including Buddhism, Chan Buddhism, Taoism, even Confucianism has an element of this. The dichotomy, the yin-yang, or sometimes yin, depending on how, um, is found uh, very explicitly expressed in Taoist metaphysics. Um, the, as I note here in, in Confucianism, there is a moral dimension. Confucianism is more supportive of the established patriarchy. So there is this idea that that the male is somehow should be dominant, whereas that is not so uh, in Taoism, that um, position is is not held so strongly. Yin is is traditionally the the uh, the female, the dark, the moon. Um, yang is is the sun, rationality, aggressive, masculinity. So these two elements that, that are that are seen reflecting throughout nature, throughout life. And the idea that they a balanced life should incorporate a balance between these two elements, a balanced kingdom, a balanced uh, natural environment incorporates the yin and the yang. And within this we see, sometimes when you think about the, um, as you're thinking about religious philosophy and you're thinking how it intersects with political developments, 
And this is especially true in Chinese history, how we have this philosophical attitude towards the, the cresting and decline of empires or, or dynasties and how each dynasty has a natural cycle, just like, just like the earth, just like a crop. Right? Um, you might think it's a little bit strange to talk about Chinese poetry within a discussion of Chinese philosophy, but they're very closely related in origin, and, and some of the Chinese poetry reflects very clearly the religious tradition in China. The Chinese poetic tradition is, in fact, the largest and longest continuous tradition in world literature. And until relatively recent, was practiced by virtually everyone in the educated class. It stretched well before 1500 BCE to the present, and flourished not just in its homeland, but also in Korea and Japan, each of which systematically adopted Chinese language and culture, thereafter developing Chinese poetic practice into their own directions. Much later, at the beginning of the modernist revolution, classical Chinese poetry even showed up far from China in poets such as Ezra Pound, an American, expressed and studied Chinese poetry and saw in its concrete language and its clarity a way to clear away formal rhetoric and abstraction. The Chinese poetry starts out with this oral tradition. And of course, since it is oral, we don't really know when, uh, when people began um, considering this as a, 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 an artistic expression. Um, but according to literary legend, we have this, this first example, the drumming song dating from the 23rd century BCE, hard to kind of let that sink in. It's a very diverse poetry. It's, uh, it also had an important impact on unifying classical Chinese language. Note that the Chinese language is, there's a written language and a spoken language. And the classical Chinese is mainly a literary language. The one as interesting uh, aspect is that the two defining characteristics of the language, empty grammar and a graphic form, are reflected in the Taoist cosmology that later became the conceptual framework shared by all the poets in the mature written tradition. The cosmology, we think, evolved together with the language during the earliest stages of human culture in China. They share the same deep structure. Eventually, this element is, is found formal written expression in the Tao Te Ching, about the 6th century BCE. The poetry is, as I said, it's sort of an empty, very minimal grammatical elements, which means that it's very flexible. It also requires a lot of interpretation. Um, you don't have um, prepositions used regularly or conjunctions. Uh, there's no verb tenses. Philosophically, one of the things that we see reflected, it is especially a Taoist concept, is this, this concept of presence in Chinese word is yu. It's simply the empirical universe. 
The ancients described it as 10,000 living and non-living things in constant transformation. And absence, which is the generative void from which this ever-changing realm of presence perpetually arises. Now, if you think about that, that's a lot. You, you should see a reflection there of, of the yin and the yang. Right? And, and this also lends itself to a Buddhist approach of the, the concepts of emptiness and samsara, which we're familiar with from, from our earlier discussions of, of uh, Buddhism. So as I mentioned, this, this uh, Taoism reflects um, these poetic traditions, or maybe it's vice versa, that are, are present from the very early stage. The, you have to recognize that Taoist cosmology represents a worldview that it's familiar in some sense with the modern Western world, it's secular, but also profoundly spiritual. It is empirical. That means asking us to test the truth of the religious assertions. What do we know? And it, it is also deeply ecological, in other words, it's looking at the whole of the world, how it works together. Here are some examples of the Tao Te Ching and how they reflect. Um, the, the poetry reflects the Tao Te Ching. And Tao Te Ching is, is, you can read it as poetry. The loftiest ruler is rarely known among those below. Next comes a ruler people love and praise. After that, one they fear, and then one they despise. If you don't stand sincere by your words, how sincere can people be? Take great care over words, treasure them. And when the hundredfold people see your work and succeed in all they do, they'll say it's just occurrence, appearing of itself. In other words, the role to be aspired to is, is essentially being not noticed, being, being powerful and not noticed. Um, the, the, the poet here is obviously addressing um, how a ruler should be. And it is, in other words, a, a ruler who is, who is effective, but is not the other people um, that he is, he is helping are not even aware of his help. Here's another uh, excerpt. Heaven goes on forever. Earth endures forever. There's a reason heaven and earth go on enduring forever. Their life isn't their own, so their life goes on forever. Hence, in putting himself last, the sage puts himself first, and in giving himself up, he preserves himself. If you aren't free of yourself, how will you ever become yourself? So, if we're going to, you know, we acknowledge that we have this um, cross-pollination happening, but we try to delineate it a bit. Uh, what Taoism is developing in from prehistory in China. Chan Buddhism is, as we discussed. In an earlier lecture, Buddhism comes from India, uh, primarily over the northern route, although it really comes from the north and the south, um, but primarily from the, the north of the legendary um, sage who brings Buddhism to China is Bodhidharma. Mohism is something that is not so well known, um, and only recently have, um, have we learn more about it, for one reason, because um, Confucianism, the people 
the Confucianist scholars ensured that the religious texts about Mohism were destroyed. And of course, Confucianism is is um, established is associated with the sage we call we know it in the West as Confucius. And legalism is a a a set of approach, a philosophical approach. It's not so much a religion; it's a philosophical approach. In some ways, that um, an approach that it might seem um, opposed, <laughs> very uh, philosophically opposed to other um, traditions such as Taoism or, or Buddhism. So legalism, is, in some sense, stands apart from the more religious uh, traditions. Confucianism, we, there actually is a um, an ancient scholar associated with the uh, establishment of uh, Confucianism, that would be Confucius, um, roughly lifespan of, of roughly 552, 479 BCE. Oh, I think on the slide here, it's an error, it, it should be BCE. Um, so roughly, notice, uh, roughly contemporary with uh, the life of the Buddha. Um, this is something that is remarked upon by religious scholars that there is this concept of the axial age when these thinkers were quite active and uh, developing religious and philosophical systems independently. So we have in the East we have Confucius, we have we have Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. We have. Um, Socrates approximately the same time asking similar questions really how should a person live um, the period that is um, when the uh, when Confucius lived is uh, a time of some tumult um, and Confucius concerns himself a lot with how um, a leader should conduct himself. What is the right way for a an empire or a kingdom to be ruled? The uh, disintegration in the second century of the Christian era, CE, contemporary era, um, sort of leads to a um, domination of, of Buddhism and Taoism at that point. So you see within Chinese history this, this ebbs, ebbs and flow of, of um, dominant religious traditions. Confucius was emphasized um, responsibility, duty. Um, you see the, um, the concept, the filial duty coming up again and again within Confucian texts. Um, in other words, an individual should perform um, the duties are, that are expected, perform them honorably. Even uh, rights such as showing respect for ancestors. Ritual, this concept li, is very important. The ritual uh, is, is something to be observed. As he put it, a prince should employ his minister according to the rules of propriety, and ministers should serve their prince with loyalty. So individuals within the social sphere should perform appropriately, responsibly. As I mentioned, the man that we call Confucius is, we have, we have evidence, this is an historic individual, um, born in the state of Lu, who served um, 
government, in government. Um, we think that he was um, an instructor to uh, young men. He did not become famous in his lifetime. He, and I think it's important to recognize that he thought of himself as a failure. Ideally, he wanted to do, be an advisor to a powerful ruler. Just, it's interesting how there, there are parallels between his thinking and, uh, and Plato. Again, not, not that more or less a contemporary um, over in, in Greece. He's very much concerned with how should people rule themselves. If we're Confucian, is it a religion? You could say not really. It's there's no there's no um, no concern about afterlife or no no deities, but in the sense of providing a format for living, well then it is a it is a, a philosophy certainly. Um, there isn't. It's not as if there are. Um, prayer is being offered for one result or another, result of being saved from hell. That's not part of Confucianism. There's a lot of um, attention to the hierarchy of the time. It is, as I mentioned before, patriarchal. So this idea that females are subordinate to the idea that the, the heavens have the the male principle and the material world of the earth is female. Taoism, as I mentioned, which is, is predates in, in um, predates Confucianism as a philosophical school of thought. Uh, the founder of Taoism is much more legendary, although there is a someone who, um, Lao Tzu, who is um, identified as the um, founder. Um, it is not patriarchal, certainly not in the same, to the same degree, anywhere near the same degree as, as Confucianism. In fact, there are a lot of references to the Great Mother, so there is this idea that of, of an earlier, uh, perhaps even a matriarchal society that uh, predated the historical China. We'll talk more about that later. Um, the Subsequent to Lao Tzu, there were philosophers who further refined the uh, philosophical approach of Taoism. Notice Taoism, Taoism, it can be spelled with a D or it can be spelled with a T. Um, so just, I have them both in this slide, so so uh, don't get confused because you see them both ways. In some texts you'll see them spelled with a D and, and other texts you'll see it um, spelled with a T. Taoism is much more intuitive than Confucianism, and it's much more, it's not concerned so much with the, you know, how society should be structured, but it's more focused on more existential questions. What is, what is life? What is the universe? How does it, how, how does it work? Um, um, what is truth? Um, and these questions are examined not in a sort of a logical sense as a way that uh, um, Socrates, for example, might examine this question, but more in a, an intuitive sense. The three jewels of, of the Tao are compassion, moderation, and humility. And you see this, you can kind of think about this fitting in relatively easily with Buddhism. This idea that Buddhism focus is on the extent that humans um, go astray when they are led by their ego, this, this, this illusion of separateness. 
and it is an illusion. So again, Taoism is is the idea is the individual becoming more selfless and more open to the answers that are provided by the universe. According to legend, I include a little bit here because I think it's a kind of an interesting story. He, just like Confucius in a sense, he is disillusioned of his ability to, to affect change in the world. And he, he calls it quit, sets out for the Western mountains and some, somebody at the border persuades him to leave behind the scroll of teachings that he has assembled, and then he vanishes. Um, Buddhism, as I mentioned, the legendary founder in China is Bodhidharma, a Buddhist monk, um, who brings Chan Buddhism to China. So this is um, Chan, the derivation of the word actually comes from Dhyana, Sanskrit word for meditation, uh, which is key, a key element of Buddhist practice. This idea that through meditation, an individual can gain an intuitive sense of reality through a variety of meditation practices, the most simple being counting of breaths, the steadying of the mind, a taming of the mind to, some, to an extent, and, and a freeing from narrow self-interest so that the individual can see the truth that is revealed by the by the universe, so to speak. The uh, Buddhist teachers were able to find a good home in China, and and the the Buddhism that developed there is we know as Chan. Buddhism. Later, you might some of you might be familiar with the word Zen, Zen Buddhism, which is nothing but a word that derives from Chan. When 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 Chan Buddhism went to Japan, it became Zen. To think about it, it's, it sounds very similar, right? The um, Chan tradition spread throughout the region, through Vietnam, Korea, and eventually made it to Japan in the 13th century. Mohism is one of the least known religions in China. Um, again, there is a legendary founder. Um, it is, in some sense, a, a uh, counterpoint to the Confucian tradition. So it is much more, hmm, love thy neighbor. <laughs> um, you might say uh, spiritually based. Um, it also has an element of uh, not being so patriarchal as Confucianism. One of the interesting things is that the uh, Mozi, the founder of Mohism, points out that following what is traditional doesn't mean that that is morally right, which I think is an important and, and uh, striking point that perhaps people wrestle with to this day. Um, we don't know a lot about Mohism, I mean about Mozi, uh, 
Um, he had disciples. Um, there was, if, if, it's sort of interesting um, you, when you read about it, there are some things that you might say, oh, it sounds similar to an understanding of Christianity, for example, this idea about an all-seeing God, a personal relationship with heaven, um, a God that knows about the conduct of people, and that this idea of, of retribution for bad behavior. Also, you know, what if you think about it, one reason that perhaps uh, Mohism never caught on in a big sense in China is that this tradition of the mandate from heaven, Mosey rejected that. So you can kind of understand how that might not be so, uh, the emperors might, might not like this religion because it casts doubt on their uh, divine favor. So, in fact, um, it, Mohism was popular in the latter part of the Chao dynasty when the Qin dynasty takes power. Remember Qin, from your other reading, you know, uh, the great emperor, the, the first emperor, um, is, uh, was a kind of brutal guy <laughs> and not averse to burying uh, thousands of scholars alive and destroying their texts. So the, uh, much of, of the, the followers of uh, Mohism uh, went to steep decline um, with the ascension of the Qin Dynasty.